Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James G. Maynard, science show host, terrible actor, worst puppeteer, and proud resident of this here planet Earth. Now, for our Earth Day 2024 episode, we're going to be exploring how fiction and storytelling have inspired environmental movements throughout history. Later in the show, we're going to be joined by Anne E. Berg, talking about her new book, Force of Nature, a free verse novel inspired by Rachel Carson. Free verse! Now, let's begin ah. by traveling back in time. What? Dinosaurs? No. No, 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 no. It's far too far back in time. Good day, good sir. By what manner do you uh, appear before Frank me? Franklin. Uh, no, no. Uh, too recent. <laughs> ah, Gilgamesh. Here we go. One of the oldest known stories, the Epic of Gilgamesh, is in part a warning of the dangers posed by over-exploitation of the land. Written nearly 40 centuries ago, the Epic of Gilgamesh was basically the world's first screw-around-and-find-out story. I'm sorry, Ishtar. It's over between us. I just have a horrible feeling that someone is going to make a really unsuccessful movie about you someday. The teachings of Buddha have nonviolence against nature as a central tenet, and Taoism has long held that protecting our environment is key to human survival and happiness. Now, uh, even in the 19th and early 20th centuries, writers like Henry David Thoreau and John Muir reminded us of the beauty and importance of nature. I spent two years, two months, and two days living in the woods. And that's all he says? Seriously. I kicked off the whole idea of national parks and nothing. But it was Rachel Carson's revolutionary book, Silent Spring, that really kick-started the modern environmental movement. Her powerful words sparked change and inspired generations of environmental writers, including our special guest, Anne E. Berg, author of Force of Nature. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's a yeah. cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Huh. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Anne E. Berg. She is a middle grade children's author, and her new book, The Force of Nature, is a delightful new imaging of the life of famed environmentalist and author Rachel Carson. Welcome to the show, Anne. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so first of all, what, what, what inspired this book? It's, it's really wonderful. Um, I was 
I was researching climate change. I was getting anxious, actually. So I started reading up on it and just trying to understand what, how our imprints, our footprints were impacting this uh, change in the earth. And, 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 often came, and I often came across Rachel Carson's name. Um, either it was just a quote of that she something she'd said about nature, or they referred to her book *Silent Spring* and her warnings. And um, I, I really only knew her as the mother of the environmental movement. That's all, you know. And I have a picture in my mind of what she looked like on a book cover, but um, I didn't really know anything more about her. So the first step in writing a book is always curiosity, wanting to know more. I, so I decided to reread Silent Spring, and then uh, I became interested enough to read her life story. And I just thought, gee, uh, kids should know about her. Um, it was time to shine the light on her again. She went through some really difficult times, and she um, nature is what got her through. So I thought she, I thought she'd be a great role model for today. Absolutely. And while we're here. Um... You know, I think a lot of people may have, certainly most people have heard the name of Rachel Carson, but what what is it that, for those who may not know more, what is it that made her so important and su such an amazing woman? Well, I'll t this is what I knew to start about her. And then what I learned uh, uh, in addition to this is what made her so amazing. But what I knew, what I know is that with her persistence and because of her book, Silent Spring, we discontinued the use of the chemical pesticide DDT in 1972. Rachel's book, Silent Spring, asks the reader, starts by asking the reader to imagine a world where no birds sing, because that's what was happening. Birds were falling from the sky and fish were dying in the streams because of our overuse of a chemical pesticide uh, on our farms, on our trees. And, uh, after her book, there were she appeared before Congress and people started complaining. And ten years after her book, we finally we finally um, banned DDT, and so it's no longer being used. But that so I that's what I knew about her. So I knew that she inspired the environmental movement because people realized what was happening and they and they m were motivated. When I read her life story, I, I I wondered where a person like, well, I had one part of my curiosity was wondering how a person like Rachel, a quiet person, uh, had the courage to speak up to all these naysayers and these really um, belittling uh, male scientists who had advanced degrees and kind of blew her off when she first came out. And um, so then I went back to her to read her whole life. And I saw that her whole life was kind of preparing her for the courage to take care of nature. Wow. And to gain a little bit more into her origin story and what, what, what brought, the, what brought Rachel Carson into being Rachel Carson? Rachel uh, grew up in Pennsylvania on a, on a farm, on a, on a farm in Pennsylvania, but I, I her parents, um, her father had bought like I think it was 65 or 69 acres in Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh, which was the booming center of the universe. And uh, his his original idea was to parcel off, parcel, you know, sections of land, and that that would be how they would support themselves. But unfortunately, the winds of Pittsburgh blew in the opposite direction, and he was unable to sell the land, uh, to sell his land. And so she grew up on these these 69 acres and that was the wonderful thing the nature and being around trees and all of that the other not so wonderful thing was the sadness that that her own father's broken broken dreams so she was it's 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 a double story of joy and 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 sorrow or disappointment that was when she was very young her brother and sister were much older than her, and so she really didn't have any other companions. So she would wander her property. And Rachel, Rachel always credited her mother with inspiring her with a love of nature. But but I think, having read about it, I believe I feel like nature nature nurtured 
Rachel, mm -hmm. because she had that dichotomy in her house of the unhappiness of some people and and yet the joy and peace she could find in nature. So that's what I was trying to capture um, when I wrote Force of Nature. That is so inspiring. And what brought, what is, what is your origin story? What brought you into science and being a writer? Well, I, I tell you, I've been writing since I'm four years old. I mean, my first poem was when I was four and went proudly marched around the house writing my, reading my poem or reciting my poem to anyone who would listen. Um, but I wasn't really, I'm not really that. I like being outside on walk, going for walks and stuff, but I'm not a heavy duty nature person. I don't enjoy camping and I'm, I'm quite frankly afraid of bugs. And when I read about Rachel, she... Her, in her family, if they saw a spider, they would put a cup over the spider, slip a cup, slip a sheet of paper under the cup and bring the spider outside. Now, mm. I'm not there yet, but I am to the point where I can understand and appreciate the beauty in the smallest living creature. And one of these days, I'm going to find a spider in my house and bravely cup it, paper it and bring it outside. I, if, if it's actually uh, two mayflies just hanging out. Up in the studio over here. I'm happy to get you a little cup of paper, which I was going to do after this interview anyway. So that's okay. <laughs> I said I'm not there yet. <laughs> Just making the offer. Um, <laughs> so, um, so how'd you come into um, loving Rachel Carson yourself so much that you want to put all this time into a book? Well, she, it was kind of infectious what she discovered. Uh, she herself was going to be, she loved nature and she loved her birds and, and, and um, her, mostly her birds and her dogs, her, pet, her pets. Mm -hmm. But um, she was going to be a writer. She, that was her plan. She went to college to become a writer. It, at that time, there weren't too many opportunities for women to be much more than a teacher and maybe until you got married, you could be a teacher. Her mother was a teacher, but then when she got married, she had to give it up. So she, her thought was to be a writer. And she herself, she like me, had been writing since childhood. I think she got her first story published when she was um, in fourth grade. So she, that was her plan to become a writer. And then she went to college, and that was still her plan until it it, became, it was a requisite for her to take biology. Mm -hmm. And taking biology just blew her away. And there's a poem, there's a poem actually in the book, which could be me speaking or it could be, it could be uh, Rachel speaking. She, she is marveling at what, ha she loves nature all the time, but now she's looking at it through a microscope and she's discovering that we only see half of it. There's so much we don't see. It, and she's she's just blown away by the beauty of what she finds in, in biology and looking under that microscope so that uh, as she and as she discovered this, this, if I would read something about something she read in class, then I would go online and I would look at it myself and I see these squiggling creatures in the water and so much light that we we don't even know about that she I I felt like I was channeling her in discovering all these this wonderful secrets of the earth that we don't even um, we don't even think about. Mm. And, um, you know, I think most people, if they're going to write a book, particularly about the life of someone, um, might do it in a sort of, you know, more pre predictable way, for instance, you know, start off the first chapter is some big event in the person's life. And second chapter would start with, you know, Rachel Carson was born and da 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 But instead, you did this, like, wonderful, wonderful, um, it, it's almost like prose. It's, it's yeah, that's why it's a verse novel. It, and I, this is like my fourth verse novel, but and most of my verse novels are historical fiction. So everything is true, but then I create the characters. But this was a little bit different because I wasn't creating, I wasn't creating Rachel. I was, um, I was uh, ch channeling her, I guess. And so I had to make sure that I understood where she was coming from, where her joy was coming from. And I find that I used to be an English teacher. So when I write in the full sentence, 
and the paragraphs. I find I, the, the, grammar, the, the grammar comes out in me. And of course, there's a place for grammar. But when I'm writing, I like to actually inhabit the character. And I find yeah. this way, right. let, this lets me do that. So you're not really you're not really reading about Rachel Carson. You're experiencing the world the way Rachel Carson experienced it. Or in my fiction, in, when I fictionalize characters, we are experiencing what they experience. Not just me as a writer, but hopefully uh, my readers as well will feel an empathy with Rachel because they'll feel her, her voice coming through them. Mm, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. I was going to say, yeah, the other thing too is that you, you know, most of it is like in first person, you, you know, you are. Right, right. You are Rachel Carson in, in this, and this is just so, so cool. I, ju I just love that experience. Um, and the other, one, other great thing about this book are the amazing images. Uh, by ah. Sophie Blackwell. How, what was that like working with her? And what was that experience? Uh, I, well, you know, that was an amazing thing because Scholastic took care of, the, or whatever you get a book published, unless you're the illustrator yourself or you're working as a team with someone, you write your words and then however the illustrator decides to go with it, you really have no say. But then they told me that Sophie Black, that they were, that Sophie Blackall was going to illustrate it. And it was amazing to me. Mm. It was almost like she was seeing the same things, see, seeing the same things in Rachel that I saw, seeing those creatures and seeing, and I think feeling it and capturing it. So I, I was really lucky um, that she is the, my illustrator. And did you open the book? Did you see it? Did oh, you yeah, open yeah. The, and no, no, open the book. Um, the cover at one point, if you open the full cover, oh, right, right, yeah, yeah, it's a full. And if you, and if you take, yeah, her whole face, yeah. and then if you take the cover off, the cover is embossed with one of her drawings. Isn't that lovely? Beautiful. I'm just gonna do this now to. Right, off. isn't that, isn't that beautiful? That is really, really gorgeous. I love that. She's so talented. Absolutely. And then the embossed, the embossed was just, I don't know, icing on the cake. It's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what would be, I mean, what would be your words of advice for kids who want to be scientists, especially girls and young women? And um... first of all, anyone can be it. Anyone oh, absolutely. can be it. Absolutely. There's no. Um, Rachel faced a lot of bias, and I think there's still a lot of bias out there. Yeah. But we, I truly, truly believe uh, that the next Rachel Carson is out there. Yeah. That um, I feel what you need to do, what we need to do, is to just open our eyes to the wonder. Wonder is one of Rachel's favorite words. She was always looking for the wonder, and she used to say she that if you if you walk with a child and you want to open their heart to wonder. Just open your open their hearts to the wonder. Don't have to name everything. Everything doesn't have to have and and let them discover. So I, I believe that young environmentalists and young writers, it's it's all about discovery and then finding your voice and your way of saying it that makes the most sense. Beautiful. And finally, um, you know, we face any number of um, climatic and environmental challenges. Um, in the coming years and decades, but what do you see as being the greatest hope for the environment? I believe the greatest hope for the environment is this, the same people that are um, the same humans kind that is ignoring the environment are the same people that can feel it if they feel the wonder of it, will want to do as Rachel did and do everything you can to preserve it. And whenever I talk to kids and I see their eyes light up and they're interested in what they see in the microscope too, that, that gives me hope. Children give me hope. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for being on this show, Anne. It was fabulous talking with you. It's very enjoyable. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and that was Ann E. Berg. Check out her new book, Force of Nature, just out from Scholastic Press. Thank you. Next, let's explore the many worlds of climate fiction or cli-fi, a captivating genre of storytelling 
that imagines the consequences of climate change and looks at what our future may be. These stories have significant roots in history. The Drowned World, 1962, by J.G. Ballard was set on a drowned world, the result of a melting of Earth's ice caps. In 1973, moviegoers developed a taste for Soylent Green. Mad Max gave us all a run in 1979, and Waterworld was drowned in mediocre reviews when it came out in 1995, despite being a halfway decent movie, alright? I, I don't... Yeah. We here at the Cosmic Companion are currently working on our own cli-fi feature-length film, Gaia Rising. This story, set in the 2060s, explores how three people from very different walks of life come together to begin to heal a world on the brink of environmental disaster, striving against obstacles in a race against time. Uh, keep an eye out for that one. As the human progression to series continues, we have the opportunity to build clean, sustainable communities on Earth and in space. Here on Terra Firma, green cities with sustainable energy production, single stream recycling, and plentiful, affordable public transportation would shrink human impacts on the environment. 3D printed houses would make buildings extraordinarily inexpensive, providing affordable or even free housing for all. Such structures are also nearly perfect for highly efficient hydroponic farming systems, providing any desired crop any time of year in any climate. Imagine living in Montreal in the middle of winter and eating avocados grown within walking distance of your apartment. This would make great nutrition available to everyone, ending food deserts and saving the environmental damage currently done by shipping foods all over the world for packaging, distribution, and sale. Nanofabricators, devices capable of constructing anything one wants at a molecular level, are already being developed. Uh, if you want a steaming hot, crunchy spinach calzone, presto! A red and white checkered runner for your hallway? You got it! I'm not gonna judge. Need a really cute parasol for your day at the fair? You get the idea. Much of the raw material needed to build, well, anything, could come from the most common of resources, dirt, water, and air. Or even recycle that red and white checkered parasol stained with spinach and feta cheese. Moving beyond Earth's Space offers environmentalists the ultimate gift for the well-being of our home world, advancing humanity to a future free of scarcity and poverty. Resources beyond the Earth, on the Moon, Mars, and in asteroids, where they can be gathered safely away from the fragile ecosystem of our home planet. Measure beyond the dreams of avarice. The path to our collective future is forged through the decisions we make in our own time. With each step forward, we carry the hopes and dreams of generations to come. Let us choose wisely, ensuring that our planet continues to flourish for the fate of humanity hinges on the choices we all make today. Join us next week for Exploring Alien Intelligence. We're going to be looking at the nature of intelligence 
and what that means here on Earth as well as beyond. We're going to be joined by naturalist, author, and octopus whisperer Cy Montgomery. She's going to share her insights on the secrets of the octopus and what we even mean when we say the word intelligence. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss this episode. You are trapped now, Secret Agent 80 Puss. Give me your secret. Never, Dr. Orca. You shall never learn the secrets of the octopus. Oh, Secret Agent 80 Puss. That was another ink, credible escape. Please subscribe, share, all that stuff. Follow. You, you, you know what to do and where to do it, okay? You know, wherever you got this episode, we're there. All right, go there. You're already there. Sign up. Follow. I don't care. See y'all soon. Happy Earth Day and clear skies.